What's up, Kyle? Gang, welcome back to physics. So what do we have here? So we got this uh, angular uh, rotational problem, right? So we have a light string that's wrapped around the outside of this hollow cylinder, right? And the mass of the cylinder is 7 point, or 4.75 kilograms, and it's released from rest. So of course it's gonna fall, and it's gonna kind of unwind the string, and it's gonna start spinning. So for part A, we're gonna find how far it's gonna fall to reach six meters a second. Right, so it's gonna fall downward, it's gonna fall, how far is it gonna fall until it reaches 6.66 meters a second downward? So let's solve this. Um, so how are we gonna solve this problem? Well, this is gonna be a work energy problem. So not only are we gonna have our normal work energy equation, but we're also gonna have rotational kinetic energy thrown in now that we're in chapter 10. So our solution is gonna start with the equation, change in energy is equal to work non-conservative. So this is the golden, you know, the golden formula in physics. So in this case, we don't have any friction. There's no air resistance as far as we know. So we're gonna set work non-conservative equal to zero. Nothing is taking energy out of the system and nothing's putting energy in the system, right? So all we're gonna stay within the system. So now we have zero is equal to the change in energy. So what is our change of energy? Well, let's think about what energies are in our system. Well, we know we're falling a height, so we know we're gonna have change in gravitational potential energy. So delta UG is what we're gonna put in there. Now what else is happening? Well, obviously we're rotating and we're in chapter 10, so we're gonna have change in kinetic rotational energy, so K rotational. Then also this, uh, or this hollow cylinder is falling straight down. It's gonna also have linear velocity, so we're gonna have to convert that regular kinetic energy. Now, so what else do we have? Well, there's no springs in the system, so I'm pretty sure this is gonna be it. So let's expand this to get our final minus initial. So it's gonna be U gravity final minus U gravity initial plus K rotational final minus K rotational initial plus K final minus K initial. So let's go through each one of these, see which ones are canceled out. So we're falling, so gravitational potential energy is gonna decrease as we go down a distance. Our gravitational potential energy is gonna go to zero at the bottom. So we're gonna have no final gravitational potential energy, but we will have initial gravitational potential energy. We're starting at rest, so we have no initial rotational kinetic energy. However, we will be rotating at the end for sure as we fall at distance. Same with kinetic energy, we're starting at rest, so we have no initial kinetic energy. So this equation is gonna become zero is equal to negative gravity initial plus k final plus k final, uh, but one of these is rotational. So now let's expand these to get what they all are. So gravitational potential energy is mass gravity height. That's what we're solving for, right? We're solving for how far it must fall, so we're looking for height. So kinetic energy rotational is one half I angular velocity squared. That's rotational kinetic energy. And then linear kinetic energy is one half mass velocity squared. Right, so what do we have in this equation? What are we solving for? So we're solving for h, and we know velocity final, but what we don't know is this moment of inertia and this angular acceleration, or this angular velocity, I mean. So we need to find a way to get rid of those. So let's start with this angular, or this moment of inertia here. How are we gonna get rid of this? Well, moment of inertia, there's equations for all sorts of different objects. You've learned how to calculate it, but we know for a hollow cylinder, the equation is one half, mass, and then it's radius inner squared plus radius outer squared. Pretty sure. Yeah, that's the equation there. So this is what we're gonna plug in for i here. Now, let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna get that zero is equal to mass, gravity, height, plus one half. And we have to keep this other one half, mass, radius outer squared plus radius inner squared. Then we have to keep this angular, right? and this becomes plus one half mass velocity squared. So right away we can cancel out the masses, right? There's a mass here, a mass here, and a mass here. These markers are kind of bad, I don't know why. Uh, so what do we have now? So let's write this equation, the next one. Ma or so masses we just canceled, so we're gonna get gravity height plus, this is gonna become one fourth, radius outer squared plus radius inner squared, W squared, plus one half velocity squared. So what do we now have now? We have the radiuses, we know gravity, we're looking for height, we know velocity. The only thing we're left with is this angular velocity, and we need to get rid of that. So we can get rid of angular velocity because we know that angular velocity times radius is equal to velocity, linear velocity. 
So what we can do is we can rearrange this equation to get that, right? Velocity, we want to get the velocity by itself because that's what we know the number is and we know radius. So velocity divided by radius, or we can say angular velocity is equal to velocity divided by radius. So this is going to be plugged in right here. And because we still have this squared, it's going to get velocity squared over radius squared. So which one of these is going to, which, which radius do we have? Do we have the inner radius or the outer radius? So we're looking at the velocity on the outside of the sphere. And so that means we're going to have to use that outer radius. So let's put an outer by this one. OK, so now we have this equation in terms of things we know. All we're solving for is h. So let's move the h over. So you have negative gh is equal to. And then let's, let's factor out a v squared. And how can we do this? So we factor out a v squared. What do we have left? So we have 1 fourth radius outer squared plus radius inner squared divided by radius outer squared. And then this is going to be plus 1 half. Now all we have to do is divide by g, or negative g, so we can get that height, right? That's equal to negative velocity squared over gravity. Fourth radius outer squared plus. Um, I missed a negative. Oh, yeah, I forgot to carry a negative down. So it's negative, negative, positive, positive. That's what I meant to do. Uh, so hopefully that didn't confuse you guys too much. Radius inner squared over radius outer squared plus one half. And this is our equation. So all we need to do is plug in our numbers. So let's go ahead and do that somewhere. Let me do it up here, maybe. So we get height is equal to, so velocity is 6.66 over gravity, 9.81. So 1 fourth. What's radius outer? So 0 0.35, right? We got to convert to meters plus 0 0.20 squared divided by radius outer, so 0 0.35 squared plus one half. You saw this. You get 3.76 meters a second. I don't even know why I wrote a five, I just said six. See, I can't speak and talk at the same time. It's the kind of hard part. All right, so that, or velocity, height, height is in meters. This should be in meters. Meters, oh my goodness. All right, so that's how long it takes, right? This object has to fall 3.76 meters until it reaches 6.66 meters a second. So now in part B, we're going to look at what would happen if it wasn't attached to the spring, or it wasn't attached to the string, and that thing just fell straight down. How fast would it be moving at this height? So let's go ahead and erase everything, and we're going to go through it again. So this time, if we're not attached to the spring, the object isn't going to rotate anymore. And if the object's not going to rotate anymore, then none of that uh, gravitational potential energy is going to get swallowed up by uh, kinetic rotational energy. So we're going to start back over. Let's start with blue again. So we're going to start working on conservative is equal to change in energy. Set that equal to zero, because it is. And so this is going to be change in kinetic energy plus change in gravitational potential energy. No rotational energy this time. So this is going to become, right, k final minus unit gravity initial, similarly to last problem. See the last time I did it? So we can move one of these over. We're going to get mass, gravity, height, equal to 1 half mass, velocity squared. And we're going to get that velocity is equal to, once the mass is canceled, square root of 2 times gravity times height. So now we're going to plug in 2 times 9.81 times the height, which is that, 3.76. And you got that velocity this time is 8.58 meters per second, I think. Yep. So this is for part B. So this time, what do we find? Well, we find that velocity is greater when it isn't on the string. So why is the velocity less when it's not attached to the string? And that's what part C is asking. So the reason that we reach a higher velocity when we're not attached to the spring is, like I said earlier, we're not losing any of that potential energy 
and none of that's getting converted to rotational kinetic energy. Right? If we go through this equation, the change in energy have to equal zero. So when we were doing part A, and we realized that we had the change in kinetic energy rotational, a lot of that gravitational potential energy initial was getting converted to kinetic energy and rotational, and that took energy out of kinetic energy linear to speed up. So both of the times, they had the same exact energy at the end of the system, right? They both had the same amount of energy kept in the system, but the energy in part A, when it was rotating, was put into that kinetic energy rotational, where in part B, it was converted entirely to linear velocity, linear kinetic energy. So yeah, that's the reason. So thanks for watching. Hopefully that helps. I'll leave any questions in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.